Bronx Community College and a member of the CUNY Brez Steering Committee. Uh, she's an award-winning poet, a prolific author of scholarly articles and essays, and the editor of noteworthy anthologies, including in 2019, Latina Outsiders Remaking Latina Identity. Her scholarship is dedicated to her own Colombian and Cuban parents who are community leaders in Chicago's Logan Square neighborhood. Professor Acosta has been part of diversity inclusion reform at Bronx Community College and a leader in the Mellon Foundation funded Black Race and Ethnic Studies Initiative Commission. Please join me in welcoming Professor Acosta. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, hi, everyone. As you know, my name is Dr. Grisela Costa, and uh, I am incredibly happy to be here as a representative of Bronx Community College. Um, I'm also happy to be here with my fellow sisters in red. This was not <laughs> planned. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and I especially want to thank the Black Race and Ethnic Studies PhD Steering Committee um, and its team effort in putting together this event. Dr. Van Tran has been telling folks that I put this event together and I am very grateful for the apoyo, but I need to mention two crucial members of the event subcommittee who had the vision for this event, shaped its structure, and carefully helped choose its participants. Please, everyone, let's all thank Dr. Robin Spencer of Lehman College and Dr. Natalie Etoke of the Graduate Center. They have taught me much and I am honored to have worked alongside them. I thank them in addition to CTO Rachel Stevenson, Marianne McKenzie, Dr. Martin Ruck, and of course, Dr. Van Tran for their leadership. Okay, now to introduce our moderator and special guests. I'm going to introduce them all via their bios. So be prepared for some excellence. We could not ask for a better panel of experts on the future of black race and ethnic studies a future we must think about and plan strategically as attacks on these studies continue to surge, despite knowing the innovation they provide is needed desperately. Our moderator, Candace Chu, joined the Graduate Center in 2010 as a professor in the PhD program in English and as a core member of the Mellon Foundation on Globalization and Social Change. She is now a member of the faculties of Africana Studies, American Studies, Liberal Studies, and Critical Social Psychology, in addition to English. Chu was a co-leader of the Revolutionizing American Studies Initiative launched at the Graduate Center in spring 2011 and has served in administrative roles in American Studies English and the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the Graduate Center. She was also the president of the American Studies Association from 2017 to 2018, and has served in a variety of governance positions at the Association for Amer Asian American Studies, the Cultural Studies Association, and the Modern Language Association. Books include The Difference Aesthetics Makes on the Humanities After Man, the winner of the 2021 Association for Asian American Studies Book Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Humanities and Cultural Studies. Um, and she is also the author of Imagine Otherwise on Asian Americanist Critique, which won the ASA's Laura Romero Book Award in 2004. And that is an abbreviated version of her bio. Dr. Brenda Green, who has committed her life to teaching, learning, and scholarship is the founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature. Yes. <laughs> director of the National Black Writers Conference and professor of English at Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York. Her research scholarship, educational leadership, and professional accomplishments span 50 years. 
and include composition, African-American literature and multicultural literature. She's the editor of the African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas and co-editor of Resistance and Transformation, Conversations with Black Writers. Um, she has also written extensive essays, grants, book reviews, and presentations in English studies. Green is also a host of Writers on Writing, a radio show and podcast featuring writers of the African diaspora discussing their lives, their creative process, and their work. She is the proud mother of two sons, Taleb Kweli Green and Jamal K. Green. Ana E. Ramos Sayas received her BA in Economics and Latin American Studies from Yale College and her MA PhD in Anthropology from Columbia University. She is the author of National Performances, Class, Race, and Space in Puerto Rican Chicago, ASA Latino Studies Book Award 2006, and Street Therapists, Aff Affect, Race, and Neoliberal Personhood in Latino Newark, uh, that won the Frank Bonilla Book Award in 2010 to 2012. Her most recent book, Parenting Empires, Whiteness, Class, and the Moral Economy of Privilege in Latin America, examines the parenting practices of Brazilian and Puerto Rican upper classes. Ramos Sayas is also co-editor of Whiteness in Latin America and the Caribbean. That is forthcoming. Prior to joining Yale in 2017, Ramos Sayas occupied the Valentin Lisana y Parrague Endowed Chair at the City University of New York. Her current research focuses on Latinx and Latin American life coaches, therapeutic social justice initiatives, and the cultural sociology of products of the self. And our last but definitely not least bio, Khalil Gibran Muhammad is the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. He directs the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project and is the former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. He is the co-editor of Constructing the Car Carceral State, a special issue of the Journal of American History and contributor to a National Research Council study called The Growth of Incarceration in the United States, Exploring Causes and Consequences, as well as the award-winning author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and The Making of Modern Urban America. He is currently co-directing a National Academy of Sciences study on reducing racial inequalities in the criminal justice system. His writing and scholarship have been featured everywhere, okay? National print, broadcast media outlets, New Yorker, Washington Post, The Nation, uh, NPR, and so forth. Um, and in the New York Times, which includes his sugar essay for the 1619 Project. And he has appeared in a number of documentaries, a native of, the Chica of Chicago's South Side. He and I went to high school together. <laughs> Same class and everything. Um, everyone, are incredible, credible speakers. Thank you, Grizel. Let me just add my thanks to um, to Grizel's, um, to her, to Grizel Acosta, um, and also to Robin Spencer, Antoine, and uh, Natalie Otoke, um, Van Tran, Martin Rock, um, Marianne McKenzie, who I actually went and I found just like five minutes ago, she's still standing um, and has been extraordinarily helpful. And Christine Kahn wanted to join us. So um, welcome to all of you, especially to you all. I'm really excited um, for this conversation today. Um, we will talk, uh, we have, we uh, shared some questions that we invited our, our panelists to think about um, for today. Um, we'll talk amongst ourselves for um, about an hour or so and then open it up for conversation. Um, I will be a little bit of a, um, a timekeeper, as in like I will interrupt you, so I apologize in advance for doing that um, if, if the conversation <laughs> just is running too long. I wanted also to note that today is um, not only the um, beautiful in end of the beautiful inclusion conference, but also the Trans Day of Visibility. Um, and given the importance of intersectionality, Given the importance of intersectionality to everything we do in Black race and ethnic studies, it seems really particularly ideal that we are launching the Collaboration Hub today. 
Um, so without further ado, let me ask you to begin by just um, helping us situate you and situating yourselves um, within or in relation to Black race and ethnic studies. So could you um, talk a little bit about what your scholarship is and what your work is in relation to that rubric? Um, and maybe we could start with Anna. And come sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to welcome, I mean, to thank everybody who has made this so welcoming and who has organized. I know that this kind of event uh, there's a lot of invisible labor that goes into it. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so my work has shifted, like like the work of most of my colleagues um, has shifted through time. Um, I began very much interested in um, working class Latinx communities in the US. And I have really been interested in how communities make um, activism work for them and define activism in their own terms rather than in a top-down way. Um, so my first uh, research experience, which came out of my dissertation field work, um, was in Chicago, in Puerto Rican Chicago, which is the Northwest side of uh, the city, uh, where many Puerto Rican activists actually deployed a very nationalist language um, to make contributions community contributions. And initially I was very um, sort of like, you know, I found it very peculiar that um, nationalism would be an ideology that would lend itself to social justice because of the different ways in which nationalism has, has been weaponized in other contexts. But in the context of, of Puerto Rican Chicago and the way in which um, anti-colonial nationalism operated there, I really um, was a moment that was very formative for me. I mean, I felt like I had, a, I was a graduate student, very cynical about life and about what we could all do. And so at that moment, uh, working with the Chicago Puerto Rican community totally shifted my, my way of understanding what can be done and what is possible. Um, and so when I moved to uh, my job, my first job at Rutgers in New, Jer in, in New Brunswick, I remember also thinking about how unique the Chicago community was, but at the same time, how there were other ways in which um, communities of color actually build connections. And the connections were not perfect. They were fraught with all sorts of stuff, but they were connections that had potential. So I focus on Newark and especially on Brazilian immigrants and um, Puerto Ricans of US born Puerto Ricans and their relationship to African-Americans in Newark and even though it was a very tough um, work to witness, and it was, as I said, you know, like fraught with a lot of tensions um, among different communities and neighborhoods, it also was very, um, uh, just very um, stimulating to think about possibilities moving forward. And that's what, how I always try to approach my work. I mean, I want to, yes, I want to identify sources of conflict, I want to identify um, tensions, but it is my hope to try to find a common way forward. Um, and so uh, after I did my research in Newark, one of the things that I had realized because of how people would always ask me, you know, so where, where are white people in your work, right? Um, and so I really, decided to understand that other side of inequality, not only who is on the damaging side of inequality, but also who benefits from inequality. So I, that's when I shifted my work a little bit to focus on privileged um, white communities in Latin America. And that's where I did my work among uh, wealthy parents in Ipanema, Rio de Janeiro, and El Condado in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I focus very much on what parenting, how parenting is used to provide a moral economy of inequality and how, you know, once people say, oh, I'm doing this in the name of my child, everything goes and everything is accepted, right? So um, I just focus on how that happens. And so this is a one of the one of the contributions that I feel that I bring in is to I feel that I, that I, I want to expand um, how race and ethnic studies uh, really is in complete response to privilege as well. It's not only something that we are focusing on who 
becomes marginalized, but how that marginalization happens, how it operates from all angles. And that's what I've what I'm still focusing on to to this time. So I would say that that's probably the best way of describing what I do. Thank you. Please. Sure. First of all, I just want to say like Anna, thanks for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, so uh, my entry point into black studies is really through being a historian and trained as such. And therefore, to some degree, um, I wasn't really sort of intellectually grounded in interdisciplinarity. Uh, mostly I was trained to be an archival historian and my mentor is David Levering Lewis. And so I've evolved over a fairly long period of time. Um, my, uh, my major work, The Condemnation of Blackness, attempted to make a pretty straightforward intervention. And that is uh, how did black people themselves understand the process of criminalization unfolding in the generation after the end of slavery? Uh, particularly outside of the South. And so much of the scholarship at the time, historical research, uh, looking at convict leasing as such, was very focused on the South. And later historians would call this Southern exceptionalism as more and more people like Robin, Spencer, and others drew our attention to the Black freedom struggle outside of the South. I also wrote as a critic of racial liberalism. Um, I was keenly interested in um, sort of tracing the traditions of progressivism uh, from its origin story in the late 19th century to understand, uh, at the time, very animated conversation when I was coming into my intellectual maturity in the mid-1990s, the Hyde the um, Crime Bill, uh, coming out of the crack epidemic, uh, not too dissimilar from how much questions about policing and punishment define this contemporary moment was very much the case uh, when I was a graduate student early on. And the degree to which I thought racial liberalism was getting a pass, uh, I was interested in telling an origin story of its failures and limitations uh, in the early 20th century. And then the last thing I was interested in uh, was uh, a history of social science as itself a tool of settler colonialism, a term I don't use in the book, but a term I understand much better now, which is to say that social science was an instrument of criminalization and domination. It was a way of defining groups of people, not just African-Americans, as incapable of self-governance uh, and full uh, participation within a liberal democracy. Uh, so that's been the container that's held a lot of my published scholarship within the um, broad contours of criminalization and carcerality. Um, I will say that uh, my time at Schomburg and my time at Harvard now have pushed me um, into uh, other interests, which to some degree keep taking me outside of the United States to understand uh, both how uh, people who are subjected to the legacies of colonialism, particularly in Africa, um, make sense of their contemporary realities in relationship to their own past. And part of that is my own fixation uh, with the uh, failures of this country uh, to reckon with its own past while uh, giving advice to other nations about how it should do so. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I also want to thank uh, the organizers and just really pleased that we have an opportunity to look at how we really push against um, the forces that have kept us from having a Black Race and Ethnic Studies uh, doctoral program at CUNY. <laughs> yeah. So um, as my colleagues, my, my research took uh, many turns. I was actually trained in composition and rhetoric and looking at basic writers and looking at the, uh, the skills uh, they do. How can we make uh, language in the classroom more exciting? And as at Meg Rivers College, I had the opportunity to meet the late John Oliver Killens, uh, who was the writer in residence at the college. And he had a vision to host a National Black Writers Conference every year and to bring together Black writers from across the diaspora to look at the state of Black literature and the trends in Black literature. I began uh, working with with um, the organizer, the former org director of the conference, Elizabeth Nunes, and um, really 
as I began doing that, my research evolved and I began to do it to look at more um, literary works and look at the, looking at the themes and of contemporary uh, black writers and looking at the themes and the issues that were coming up. We focused on issues such as what responsibility does the writer have? What is the social responsibility of the writer? How do writers um, use their literature to have acts as acts of resistance? How do writers use their literature to expand the master narrative to, um, to create counter narratives? And as I began to uh, do that research, I realized it was important, for me it was really important in interacting with writers to find a way of documenting what contemporary writers are saying. And that has been my, my work over the last two decades is in hosting the National Black Writers Conference. I have an opportunity to work with my colleagues and to come up with themes that I see present in the literature of contemporary Black writers, and also to actually interview those writers through the radio show, the writers on writing and podcasts that I have. It's, uh, a, it's very important that we document the voices of the range of writers across generations. So part of what we do is we bring um, writers who, who would not normally be in the K through 12 curriculum, we bring them into the classroom, we bring their texts into the classroom and we bring teaching artists into the classroom and so that they're reading. They're reading um, Tony Medina's I Am Alfonso, the young people this and, and the hate you give. Um, they, uh, in that's with our young people. And of, as a teacher, it's always been um, important for me as someone who's who's worked, you know, as I said, teaching and, and learning for over the, the, the last five decades, it's really important to me that students see themselves represented in the text that they create. So the programs that we have, um, Re-Envisioning Our Lives Through Literature is one of the programs we have for our youth. We bring together emerging and creative, uh, emerging and contemporary writers to read their work, people whose, whose books would not normally be uh, read, books who are uh, authors who would not normally be showcased. The center becomes a place for showcasing writers whose voices need to be heard and whose, who need to be integrated into the curriculum. We have many uh, black writers throughout the ages who, who end up only having their books taught when it's a, it's time for Black History Month or Latino History Month. And it's, it's really, um, really unfortunate. So how do we create those spaces where those texts are taught um, all of the time? And you do that by having a conference. When we do a conference, we use the writers who are part of that conference. We are asked the faculty who are teaching our college level courses to make sure that they're using those books. Uh, we uh, celebrate writers by giving them deg honorary degrees. We are, we're in the midst of a conference on black speculative fiction and we're celebrating Cherie Renee Thomas who did a book called Dark Matter, which, um, really was one of the first seminal works that documented the fact that black writers have been writing speculative fiction for years, going as far back as the, the 18th century. W.E. Du Bois wrote a story that was um, considered a black speculative fiction. We're also celebrating Jewel Parker Rose. So how do you, how do you create spaces where the general public as well as um, our students and faculty know about all of these people who are writing. The, the, the field of publishing and literature is very expansive, but we don't have a way to showcase the many voices and writers we are hearing. And I also write book reviews. Um, we don't have enough um, black writers writing book reviews on the books that are being published. You, um, I just, I just, I just did a book review on our, the National Book Board Award winner, Imani Perry. 
And so this, the book review, I, it's written in such a way that it's going to, that people who normally would not read that review would have access to it. Uh, w, uh, Take My Hand, Dolan Perkins Vacans is a wonderful writer, Valdez. So again, my, my um, goal is making sure that we're documenting the work of people who are currently writing and we're also archiving that work. And we're doing that with the help of Bressy. We have a Bressy grant to archive um, the program going back to 1986 from the National Black Writers Conference. And we're archiving all of the work that the Center for Black Literature has been doing. Thank you. So, you know, one of the things that strikes me is um, how different your trajectories are actually, but also that there is a common thread and that has something, um, something about the worldliness of intellectual life, right? The worldliness of work that um, uh, the kind of scholarship and teaching that you're doing is always both grounded in how it matters in the world, but also um, arises from the different kinds of communities or formations where you're located. Um, so maybe in, in kind of continuing with that thought and thinking a little about um, your origin stories, how you got to Brezzi or you know a, a relationship to it, um, I wonder what you um, say to undergraduates and graduate students now, um, given the kinds of foreclosures to the humanities, to um, public education, certainly, but to higher education, to K through 12, um, across the board in the United States and elsewhere, about the importance of Black race ethnic studies, um, about how they might see their um, how they might commit to a project that seemingly um, they're being told has no instrumental future in it, that they can't land jobs. Um, are there particular conversations that you have? How do you shape that, uh, that conversation for them, or that understanding? Maybe we'll go backwards this time. Okay, thank you. So this, it's very timely because when you talk about the divestment in humanities, but it's, it's really ironic when you look at what employers want. They want people who are critical thinkers, who have good writing skills, who have, who have a worldview, who know um, how to move across genres, who know how to move across disciplinary spaces. And so despite the fact that we have, uh, we're at a high point of having social unrest, the, white, the rise in, in white supremacy, and um, the pushback against having black literature and African-American history in the schools. This is the perfect time. Our students, our young people want more courses, want more programs in black literature in black race and ethnic studies. They are seeking it. It's sometimes ironic, I think, that people who are in leadership and administrative positions say, oh no, we should just only be concerned about giving, um, having curriculums where students can get immediate jobs. But the students are craving that. And if you look across the country, many colleges have added um, Africana studies, have added courses in, in black studies to their curriculum. So I think that we're at a critical time where we should be taking the lead in, in showing what can be done uh, we did that over 30 years ago. Well, no, 50, I guess 50 years ago. <laughs> I keep going back. We did that and we, sh we should be at that point again now. This is the time when we have to take leadership and, and, and help our students to understand how important it is and that any skills they're learning in Black race and ethnic studies are transferable. transferable. I have two minds on this uh, subject. Uh, one is hopeful, one isn't. I'll start with the hopeful one. So uh, I teach uh, at a policy school and it, I'm a total fish out of water. Um, it just, there's no humanities baked into the curriculum or an expectation as such. Uh, most of what students are encouraged to learn and what my faculty colleagues are capable of teaching, some version of applied economics um, and to some degree, uh, negotiations and how to convince people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. <laughs> so 
so there's not a lot of humanities baked in. Um, I won't waste my time trying to figure out why I'm there, but um, nevertheless, I am there. And I've spent now seven years uh, off and on with leave convincing uh, students who were somewhat skeptical that they should take a class. Uh, I teach a class variously called Race and Racism in the Making of the United States as a Global Power. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this example because I've seen cohort after cohort of students walk in the door, um, uh, most of them not, I teach a core class now, so I've taught 250 of every master's of public policy student at the Kennedy School. That's only the last three years. And so I've had the elective version of this course where students obviously are self-selected, but even then half of them were a little bit like, I kind of want to take this class, but I'm not sure if this is a good use of my time. Hmm. So what am I saying that is hopeful in this um, role? Um, if you're able to communicate race as a form of power and to use multiple valences in order to communicate that over say the past 500 years of transatlantic slavery, then it doesn't take that long for students to not only realize how much they don't know about how this form of power works, but also how fiercely urgent it is for them to begin to think about their own work in relationship to this history. And so for those students who are almost guaranteed to work in the world with tremendous power and privilege, um, the missing link is not so much that they're gonna get a job because I'm not teaching undergraduates. The missing link is that they're actually less likely to do harm in the world and they understand it as such. And I think that's hopeful, uh, but I had to make the case along with student activists that such a course should be taught to every entering student in the master's in public policy court, cohort. So we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem when adults in the room decide that this is unimportant or optional to learn. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a segue to the less hopeful part of it, which is there are a lot more adults today making an argument yes. that uh, this is not important material, that you're not gonna get a job. I, I wanna believe um, uh, Dr. Green's um, stats on uh, the adoption of these programs. My, my guess and sense of things is there's been stasis. Mm -hmm. There was a growth period and things have quieted. And uh, of course the attacks in the K through 12 arena, which I know we'll talk about, um, are not helping the situation. I'll give one final anecdote on, on what makes me concerned about this. Um, when the signal, so the two quick signals, one was famously Obama questioning the value of an art history degree um, while president. And the other signal uh, is the, what I see as a growing divide between people who are on the ground doing activist work and the knowledge producers on campuses being able to work together in a productive uh, form of tension, as well as have community and relationships that would uh, allow those two things to, to go hand in hand. And to me, I feel like that rupture is uh, greater than it's been um, and since I've been working as a professional. Well, even though we didn't plan ahead, I feel that it um, that those, both perspective resonates so much. Um, so I wanna go to the micro level of this um, because I've been thinking more about that lately. Um, so I've taught in three institutions. I've taught at Rutgers, I've taught at CUNY and now I'm teaching at Yale. And the one thing that is common is how fantastic my students are. Um, I get a lot of first generation students, um, students of color. At the same time, this is my concern and I don't know how to address this, but how do we, not only teach the subjects, subjects, but teach them in a way that requires students to learn history. And, and, and this is, I mean, I'm not trying to go back to not being interdisciplinary, but right now, um, you know, one, one of the things is that most of our students are very, so, especially the graduate students, are very susceptible to trendy language that is very depoliticized. If you type, decolonize on Google, there's like 300,000 items. Some of them decolonize yoga, 
Some of them decolonized the coffee shop. And to be honest, I mean, I, I have gotten to the point where I will just circle that kind of language and ask people to go and find stuff for me, to go to the archives, to go to the, you know, uh, I find myself teaching about finance in the classroom. I teach about banking. I teach about stuff that, you know, I, I need them to know stuff. I need them to be able to say, to have an argument when they graduate and bring stuff up. And I've increasingly noticed that that has been less and less the case. And I am, I am worried and I would love to, I mean, I think that this is such a great space to be able to go in that direction because um, even in, like right now, Yale spends a lot of money and resources in the humanities. The humanities is probably the strongest uh, feature of, of the university, but it does not address those more micro uh, ways of understanding power. And it becomes very much about sounding smart and they feel like sounding smart is just defaulting into heavy top-down theory. And when you ask specific things, they don't know that. And this is Yale when they have all the privilege in the world. They're not teaching five classes as TFs. They're, you know, they they get funded for like the whole five years or more. Uh, and still, is that defaulting? Um, so I'm not proposing anything. I'm just making. I'm just putting it out there out of frustration, and also because I do think that there has to be a way that collectively we find. Um, we move forward because this is becoming something that requires that we understand communities again. It's not something that is going to happen in the Ivy Tower or in the university setup. It will require our students to really turn, be very public facing about what they do. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. I mean, so that's the perfect kind of segue or con um, continuing this conversation to really think about what the pressing issues are. Um, and part of, you know, I was just gonna say with this question, like Florida, go, you know? Um, <laughs> but we can actually also like really importantly, Anna, I think um, expand that, right? So we're focusing on a particular place in a particular situation right now, but some of what you are all describing is actually not locatable to this moment where um, there is this particular uh, effort to censor. Um, knowledge to whitewash history um, that's unfolding, but rather a different, you know, a whole array of things. So I wonder if you could start us talking or thinking through um, what, how you might identify what those pressing issues are, and certainly addressing um, the contemporary, um, you know, situation in Florida and elsewhere um, mm -hmm. that's unfolding. I, I actually, I, I thought of asking Khalil to start this because He's in my inbox everywhere, organizing and writing letters and statements and mobilizing the day of action around this. So uh, maybe you would start sure. and then we yeah. can go. Yeah. Well, uh, in the tradition of resistance, uh, on May 3rd, hopefully <laughs> some of you in this room will commit to doing something, what we're calling a national day of action, uh, freedom to learn. And uh, and roughly speaking, aside from the, the day of action and May 3rd and uh, you can sort of Google it and, and look for the link to, to sign up. Uh, the larger uh, crisis here is that uh, um, the problem of the global South and uh, capitalism and uh, end times climate change um, is stirring up trouble around the world, to be euphemistic. And the moment that we find ourselves in with the uh, resurgence of white nationalist and um, xenophobic movements and anti-refugee uh, legislation around the world, including here in the United States, um, is predicated in part on the inability of people to um, call a spade a spade, to name the conditions under which they live and suffer, or prosper, if that's the case. And therefore, anti-truth legislation and memory laws as such um, are an old tool of fascism um, to uh, enable propaganda and power to flourish uh, in the wake of uh, suffering. Nobody in this room needed that history lesson, uh, but that is exactly what's playing out right before us. And it seems to me that there 
there is something broken in the ability to write for ourselves or to write for our publics or to write for social media that is insufficient to meet the challenges of this moment. Mm -hmm. I think it's true in journalism. Um, and so the act of voice, which is essential, it's what makes us human beings, um, is enough to survive, but it may not be enough to overcome the challenges we face in this moment. And so we need something more. Um, I mean, the, the ground upon which Black Studies itself as a field proper within the academy grows out of that very blurry distinction between voice, knowledge production, and activism. And, uh, and so again, I could repeat all of the talking points of our moment, but cutting off the next step, um, which is the activism, is going one step before, which is the knowledge production. Um, our enemies are more or less fine with us having a voice, and to some degree, even our students in our classrooms having a voice. But as we cross the bridge, the, the metaphorical bridge to uh, what happens in primary and secondary education, uh, if we cross over into the workplace, uh, even if we cross over into the public square increasingly, uh, then the uh, state will engage in forms of surveillance, suppression, or outright violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there are risks um, that are greater today than they were a decade ago. Uh, they may not be greater than they were in the 60s and 70s, um, but those risks uh, are real and worth taking. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, one one of the things about crossing into that public sphere is precisely that there are. I feel that there are so many structures in place that academic context actually uh, place on us as faculty, but also on students that make that crossing, which is so necessary, even if it's so dangerous, very much something that needs to be done. And yet, we're not given. You know, we're not given the tools to be able to either train students to to do that step of talking to different publics and being involved. Um, but at the same time, you know, we find ourselves expecting the institution to give us that tool. So it's it's kind of where are we expecting liberation to happen? I mean, because it's clear that it's not happening in academia, right? So, <laughs> so, um, but but we keep expecting it to happen, right? And and there are very many um, possibilities in acad in academia for that, but it but it's not in enough. And so um, so I feel that it, it whatever process of um, in institutionalizing uh, black or, or ethnic studies will really require require um, a push against institutionalization. So is that kind of Figuring out and being creative about what, how to, how to understand all those pools that we're facing, um, and there's no easy answer. I don't think that Florida is exceptional. You know, I, I think you know Florida is obviously the craziest, most open one, um, but <laughs> you know, but it's certainly just the outcome of things that have always been, been happening for a while. Um, so I think that it, at the same time that it's very frustrating and very scary, it is also a moment that we're finding ourselves that I think we're starting to recognize as something that requires action beyond the narratives that we spin. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, as you were talking, I was thinking uh, we have these forces against us, but I think we have to look at the lessons we learned. And I'm going to go back to the lessons we learned um, in the 60s and in, in the 70s. If, if people did not become intentional and deliberate about having a call for Black and ethnic studies, it would not have happened. You're always going to have forces against you. So you have to, I think, um, think, think very strategically about what you can do from your own space, from your own classroom, from your own uh, community, whether it be academic community or the community outside, you have to think about deliberate strategies that you can put in place. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but it won't happen unless you actually face it and go into 
the classroom. I mean, I'm going back to K through 12, going back to the resistance, as, as Khalil said, around um, there might be more people saying we don't want the humanities. <laughs> yes, they're saying that. But part of what's the wonderful thing about being an academic is that you just have a lot more freedom, I think, to be able to push and to um, challenge and, and question and, and to be persistent. And those are the people who got us to where we are. You looked at what happened in the civil rights struggles, the, you know, the black studies and ethnic studies struggles, what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. All of this has happened is because people were in the forefront. And I think we have to remind our students that one of the things we're doing is to train, is training them to be training them, or should working with them to be leaders. Um, movements are always led by students. And as faculty, we have a responsibility to guide them and um, work with them to show how they can have these movements happen. It's not gonna always happen with the oldest, but our students are the key. And they're looking to us. They're looking at, they're looking for guidance and they're looking to us. And if we do nothing, they will do nothing. I'm reminded as um, as you were speaking, that question on a, um, where does liberation happen? It, it made me think of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's in this building. Um, um, her theorization, her, her provocation and her claim that freedom is a place and that it is place making, but it is also the kind of creation of place and creation of space um, um, for, the, for the proliferation of um, ways of living that that are about thriving, right, rather than about um, foreclosure. But the other thing that that occurred to me in listening to you and thinking about risk is actually um, something Rod Ferguson has said and has written about, which is um, courage as an intellectual category, right? So he's really talking about those insurgent social movements and insurgent movements from the 1950s and 60s, um, where the division between what happens in the street and what happens in the academy it isn't that it didn't exist, but rather that we could actually learn from the knowledge practices of what was happening in those streets about courage as something that was intellectually valuable, that was intellectually crucial in, in bringing some of these ideas forward um, and not simply something that happens outside of the academy at, you know, because of institutionalization. Um, we have a, one final question, which is um, we've, we've asked our speakers to think about um, share one thing you wish that Black race and ethnic studies uh, might do in this current moment in order to ensure a future you delight in seeing. So before I turn to that, I'm just going to say um, there are mics on the sides of the of the room. If you have a question that you are are mulling, um, please feel free to uh, kind of you know think through them and and make your way to those mics, and we can open up um, after our our final round. Of oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was really hard to come up with one question, but one of the things I want to see, we're at a time when Black studies programs, um, ethnic studies are disappearing at the university. Uh, we were, The faculty who are teaching in these programs are not being placed, departments are being downsized. And so I would like to see a real deliberate focus on making sure that the departments and programs that were begun are sustained and that there are deliberate strategies to recruit more black faculty uh, students where we've lost students, black students at the senior college that CUNY um, aligned its mission to really make sure that the college, the, the university represents um, this city. So there has to be a deliberate effort and just just um, every student should be required to take a black studies and race course. Every student should, that should be a graduation requirement for every student. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll snap on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually like that a lot. I mean, it's, it's remarkable um, to bear witness to the, I, I mentioned to the president uh, earlier, the, uh, academic malpractice that happens in higher education today, 50 years after black and ethnic and women and gender studies have evolved 
such that uh, most professional schools, and I'm just leaning into it because that's where I've been for you know seven years now, uh, it's just nowhere to be found. Mm. I mean, it just doesn't exist. Mm. And if you think about the irony that while most of these struggles have been about institutionalizing um, the place of black race and ethnic studies on campuses, um, the places where those students learn how to be professionals and become gatekeepers of power and privilege in our society um, can completely opt out, uh, whether it's law school, business school, medical school. So a lot of the fervent that has uh, emerged in the wake of the killing of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in the summer of 2020 has been directed to the American Medical Association, to the American Public Health Association, uh, to policy schools like mine, around this issue of how is it possible that we can empower people who have such ignorance about, again, not a thing that always existed in the abstract in the world uh, at infinitum, but in fact has a particular historical moment when it emerges as a way to redistribute the world's limited resources. Um, and so some of us have been winning that argument. And I think that the contribution I will add to, to Brenda's statement is that um, that claim needs to be made beyond where we sit in the humanities in graduate arts and sciences or in colleges of arts and sciences. And we need to push that argument uh, elsewhere. I have four Harvard Business School students uh, in my class currently and I think this is the first time ever. We have joint degree students. Sometimes they're, yeah, you know, not sometimes. Generally, they'd be business and policy students, but they are four business school students and none of them are black. Um, and they're just like, it's a wasteland over there. Mm. Not only is it a wasteland when it comes to understanding how race and racism work, how ethnicity and, and, and racial identity operate in the world, um, they, the school is hostile to it. Mm -hmm. So, that leaves us with a tremendous opportunity um, to build our capacity because if I'm right, um, one, there'll be less harm, uh, and two, uh, we could have a virtuous cycle uh, where the schools on our various university campuses that actually are revenue generators, because <laughs> all these students are paying to go to graduate school in those places, not always in the arts and sciences, um, will create a generation of people who will defend uh, what we do. Yes. Um, so we do have that opportunity to make the case across the university space. Yes, and following on that, I mean, we can see how the Harvard Business School or School of Public Policy might take that stand. It's very much difficult to see how the CUNY Graduate Center takes that stand because being in this place was what drew me back to therapy. And that, but that's another story that we'll just deal with later. There, oh God, it drew a lot of people back to therapy. Yes. Um, so- I was speaking to a national audience. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just, I, I think that sometimes we expect resistance in certain places and then we don't expect it in others. Um, so this is why I'm just so proud of the Bresi Commission and what they did because um, even six years ago or seven years ago, we would not, like literally we would not be here in this space right. now talking about this. Um, and I'm talking and I'm, you know, I'm coming from the anthropology, like anthropology is generally, you know, discipline that tends to draw in people who are more receptive to certain things, but not even here. So I think that um, that just identifying places that are the expect the suspects that the, like, expected places, but also trying to understand how power operates in places that is not, they're not so, um, it's not so evident because um, this battle that we're facing will require that. I think that differently from the 60s and 70s, where I felt that there was a certain cohesion and ability to identify power and inequality, mm -hmm. sometimes now it's not as evident and and but we still need to figure it out and so i i just really would love to see something building here um here like literally at the graduate center 
to start challenging those power dynamics that exist in this very space because I mean, I was here for five years. I could not figure them out. I mean, and it, that was the most frustrating part. Like, I'm like, I study power. Like, where where do I, like, how can I not see it? You know what I mean? And so, so anyway, so I think that we need to to be here and try to see it and try to keep looking into it and planning how to dismantle some of that. So, yeah. Thank you. So we can open up to questions from the audience. Um, I'm be glad for you guys to have an open spot. I wanted also to give you an opportunity to speak with each other if there are other things that you wanted to follow up on. Um, Van, please. So um, first of all, thank you so much to the entire panel. This has been amazing. Um, I love this intellectual conversation, but I'm also a pragmatic person. So let, let me bring this conversation down to a more pragmatic level. And it's the question of funding. Um, what arguments do you make to both public and private funders as to why breast deserves funding? And not just that, but generous funding support. Uh, we're not Harvard, we're not Yale. We don't have billions and billions of dollars of endowment that we can decide to provide to CUNY or the GC or the campuses. How can we help make this case? Thank you. I was gonna say, we, we've had um, one of the exciting things about working um, with Bressy and being on the commission is to look at the work that has come out of this, to look at the research, look at the curriculum projects, look at the, the, uh, the writing that's come out, I think, we have a wealth of information that has come out as a result of our dedication to this. And when we began working on the commission, we were very concerned that this would not be something that was useless. I think we have the documentation to take to funders and to say, this is what can happen and it can be expanded on and we can be a model for what other people are doing. I'm just amazed that all of the work that's that's coming out every week is something new. What people are doing across the university, people are feeling, the faculty are feeling much more empowered. Students are, are coming back and are excited about the work. And I just think we need to, sh to showcase that. Very quickly, you know, like every nobody has money. I mean, Yale has no money. They, everybody just complains that they don't have money. Trust me, it's, it's insane. And you know what, unless you are at the table where money issues are discussed, you don't know how much money, I mean, like I'm not, you know, but but money is placed in whatever, whatever the power goes and that's how, so I think just doing an assessment of internal, of like an audit of where the money goes, I, it, you know, is a point to start and I'm not trying to, you know, um, undermine the, the different, but, but I do think that um, it's, amazing how money all of a sudden comes up when there's some real genuine interest in something. Um, and so that being a component on the practical level of how to fund things, not the, the only thing, but just one part of it, I think is a, is a way to start or to at least include in the, in the uh, plan. I, I love Anna's uh, in, uh, reminding uh, all of us that the richest institutions in the world cry broke too. Yeah. Um, and I got lots of stories, but um, <laughs> right. I wanted to they add. Have, they, they don't have money in the same, not in the same way that CUNY doesn't have money though, right? Like they, they may cry yeah. poverty, but it's a different form. Yes. Yes. Right, but, but it's the austerity in the intellectual circles that we sure. run in, yeah. you know, essentially yeah. feels the same and in some ways looks the same. Sure. Okay, so I, I wanted to say that, um, and I've, I've dealt with this a lot and I've thought about it a lot and I've uh, worked on it. So the, the market economy does not reward this form of knowledge. Okay, so that we recognize. But within the market economy that shapes higher education, particularly around fundraising, um, there's a lot of prestige that is um, commodified in terms of 
uh, how donors are solicited by universities, including the CUNY, um, and what donors want in their relationship to a university. So part of what leadership has to do to be convinced of or to build capacity for uh, is to essentially tell those donors that you can't launder your reputation um, or gain prestige with my institution if this kind of work is not important to you. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not formative to how you came of age and how you understand how power works in the world, but that's how we understand it. Mm -hmm. And so for this institution, we would love your check, mm -hmm. um, but if, if the terms of accepting your check is to put your name on a building that you imagine is a priority for us, which, when in fact it isn't a priority, then it's kind of on, on, on us if we keep accepting that exchange and right. us being the institutions and the representatives who speak on our quote unquote behalf. Yes. Which one? I don't know who was you go. First. I'll go after you. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. Hi. Um, this question. Um, so sorry. I'm a, do a doctoral candidate about to exit and go into the job market. Um, and so the question that I'm asking is for um, emerging junior scholars. Um, because first of all, thank you so much for what you said. It is my experience that we are all getting a Southern education. Um, my degree is like my research topic is looking at the economy, um, like black women and wealth. And um, I went to two Ivy Leagues. And when I went back to the syllabus, I also teach in a program, we start at the industrial Re revolution. And I'm like, how do we build it? Um, and I'm, I just went on a hunt to like look at everybody's because that's what I'm gonna do. And then I wrote, I looked at Harvard. So I looked at, I'm at Penn. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> and now, of course, I'm pissed because that's what's happening. But when I start to have to push, because it's ethically, un, it's, it's, it's like ethically, I can't engage in this, right? Ethically, um, I've been investigated twice. Like I'm fighting one battle right now at a major institution with a lawyer um, because I am uh, like against, I am like um, in violation of the policy, just who I am, right? And so now I'm trying to pause and just process and figure out like, I am about to graduate. I am about to enter into this field. What is the strategy for me and faculty who look like me and ethics? I mean, I'll take a first stab at it. I mean, uh, I say this to students who are entering grad school as opposed to those exiting grad school. Um, but I guess both apply, which is to say, um, pick a program where you can be supported by people who value you and what you do. And that may seem obvious, but a lot of students have to be reminded of that when they're chasing after the name of an institution, but it's a desert in terms of what you can find. And I think in your case, um, it's even more true given your values and principles that you work in an environment uh, where people will value you and what you do. Um, but make no mistake about it. I mean, <laughs> higher education is in a, a period of tumult um, more generally, and the categories of work are very unstable. Rutgers is on strike, uh, or soon to be, uh, my alma mater. Um, and the face of power will increasingly be BIPOC people and BIPOC women. Um, and so it's gonna get really swirly uh, <laughs> when those decisions coming from on high, you know, look like you, like a black woman saying, you know, we don't have money for graduate students uh, any longer. Um, so part of, part of the long-term strategy, which doesn't solve your immediate problem, is that all of us have an obligation to build those communities of strength amongst us, to be more careful about playing representational politics, um, because they're going to be increasingly used against us, um, because, you know, 
all skin folk and kin folk, as they say. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to you more about other practical strategies, but you know, I think the, the most important takeaway is be very sharp about the environment you accept to work in. I think I'm gonna throw in one extra thing to that, which is um, the kind of work that we can do differs from situation to situation. So find the thing that you can do now that allows you also to do your work, to have um, money to pay rent, to be able to put food on the table, to keep your job or whatever form you need it to be. Um, and that's gonna look different than when you are a senior scholar who, are, who is at the Grad Center or at an Ivy League institution, you're gonna be able to do different things. The, the, the category of risk is not one size fits all. So it's okay for you to find things. And then you gotta get your people, your faculty people to stand, to put their bodies in between you and whatever trouble there is. So there are senior people to you. So those people need to get sucked in, you know, um, and, and other people can help you figure out who those people are. Right. I, would, I would also add to that is to seek out professional organizations um, that um, have, some of them have caucuses. You have to seek out people outside of the university. I think part of my strategy for surviving higher education was, was making sure that I continually worked across, across the university, different colleges and my professional organizations. They really helped to give me the strength. As a black woman in higher education, I felt alienated and marginalized on many, many occasions. And it was the people outside of the university who gave me that support and strength to keep going on. And that's really, really important. Thank you. And you know what, like, I don't know, it, never feel like you have all your eggs in one basket ever, ever because, and I know that this is, you know, but this is a job. It's a job that we spend a lot of time and resources on getting, but I sometimes feel that um, graduate students uh, take a lot of it. I mean, take a lot of it um, very personally. I mean, and 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 view this job as a as a way to determine their own value, and that's not, you know, this this is a career, this is an entire industry that is really going to increasingly rely on contingent labor right. that is going to be exploited. That is happening already, right? Like we don't know what tenure will look like in a couple, like a, a decade, right? So all that to say that. Um, as, as difficult as it may seem, and while you continue pursuing that good fit for you, that, that what you really envision for yourself in terms of a career in, in this field, always have a plan B. Even, even after you get the job that you want, you know, like always have a plan B because otherwise you're really handing in the power. Um, and so, and maybe that's easier said than done, and I totally get it. And I think that right now is such a different moment than when probably when we all of us, when all of us went into the labor market. Um, but you know, all the all the um, advice that my colleagues here have given are really important to to keep in mind. Thank you, A, B, C, and D. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dion. I'm a faculty member at City Tech. Um, I'm a member of the Black Faculty and Staff Association, and I'm actually probably still here because of Black Faculty and Staff Association. I got association outs. I got support outside of my institution when I was being really injured within my institution, and so I just and I just am so grateful to them. Um, but I just wanted to say that that I didn't expect that. I expected to always be traveling and fighting alone. And then they made it so I didn't have to. And I'm just overwhelmed kind of with gratitude. But that is not my question. I am also a Yale, and I call it evil Yale alum. And before I ask my question, I will just say, I work with the Hip Hop Archive at Harvard. I'm a Yale alum. I will put my Brooklyn City Tech undergraduates against those Ivy League kids any day of the week twice on Sunday. <laughs> they are so brilliant and powerful. And I just need to say that. So I want to go back to Brezzi. And I asked the same question at a Brezzi event yesterday. yesterday. Um, uh, and I went to another panel that made me 
add another layer to it. So my question would have been, and it still is, how do we center the blackness in Brezzi um, in a way that is substantive rather than symbolic? What I see a lot of, because I'm from California, um, there's a lot of, uh, one of the things we've had in academia at California is this idea that you use black, the high visibility of blackness to open a door. And then once you're in, you just push the black people to the side and step over them and, you know, hope that they don't, hope that they don't ever get off the ground. And sometimes we don't get off the ground. So how does, how does Brezzi center blackness? And at the same time, because I really believe uh, in coalition building and solidarity um, connections, how do we center blackness and have a really rich intersectional multi-ethnic coalition? Like how do we maintain that balance? And then also I went to a black women's panel yesterday and we are suffering, including me. Like it wasn't like they're suffering. It was like, we were all like, you know, so that all of this very fancy inclusion, diversity, equity and access work, you know, gets these, you know, a lot of attention. And then when it's time to get the work done, it gets dumped on a whole bunch of black women until we're worked into the ground. And so how do we uh, keep sexism and the critique of sexism um, central in this uh, discourse? So those are kind of, how do we keep blackness central? How do we get se keep sexism central and critiquing it central and still form meaningful coalitions? That's oh, a lot. <laughs> Small questions. Want to start here? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I just want to include class in that um, <laughs> statement. I mean, I feel that that's the first thing to go in the U.S. But um, but yeah, I mean, like every everything that you just mentioned. I mean, it just clearly it is um, that kind of balance of how this identity politics politics take actually pit us against each other in many contexts and who wins and who loses from doing that. Um, so other than agreeing with, um, you know, with what you just said, I don't know that I have um, a question, like an answer for how do we privilege, for, you know, privilege Blackness unless we also include the rate, the class piece, but that's just my perspective. I think that I, I also don't want to see a situation in which all the people that end up benefit benefiting are people who have the privilege from the beginning because of wealth or because of whatever other situation. But and and this is yeah, not one or the other. But no, I just want to um, add. I think um, it's it's always interesting. Some of my colleagues have heard me say this. The the commission. Um, initiative, the Brecci Commission is called Black Race and Ethnic Studies. And I think that has sent a strong message. I think, first of all, we cannot be afraid to say Black. You know, so it's, it's, it's okay. And to recognize what um, the studies of uh, what Black studies symbolizes and Africana studies symbolizes, we can't be afraid to recognize its disciplinary qualities and characteristics um, and look at it as also um, look at it in relation to um, ethnic studies and race. I, I, I just think that it's, it's respecting the discipline and not allowing the discipline to be uh, submerged. I, I had an interesting experience when at one point I was asked to uh, to take on another responsibility at Meg Rivers College. And I said, well, I founded the Center for Black Literature. I want to make sure that whatever I do, I hold on to that. And um, the person leadership said, fine. And then one person said, um, well, she has to make a decision. And we want to change the name of the Center for Black Literature. We want to take Black out of it. I said, well, you just made my decision for me. I'm not going anywhere. Right. You know, they wanted to give it the name of a person. 
So you have to, you say, you, 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 can't, you have to look at what's happening in different ways that people come at it. And so I think that you can um, respect that and center that and also recognize that we also have to um, look at what other components of ethnic studies have brought in. You bring, bring in race, I mean, uh, gender and class. That's, that's, that's also important, but we can't lose that. Yeah, so, uh, so look, uh, workplaces are uh, dangerous places to spend a lot of time, <laughs> period. <laughs> And, uh, and obviously the way that power cuts in our society, black women often bear the greatest burdens. Uh, so I just wanna affirm what you've described. Um, you know, it's always situational. There is no one size fits all how to remap power in those places, but you have to be, I'm gonna sound really old and conservative, but um, <laughs> the, um, if you were to start from scratch, you have to you have to maintain your credibility um, because people will use that uh, if if there's a failing, if there's a mistake, uh, you will have a very hard time overcoming uh, how power works in in you know within a workplace, whether you define it as a department, a school, a set of cubicles, <laughs> whatever the case may be. So that's just to me always really good advice. Um, be bulletproof as best you can be as you exercise whatever power or uh, ally building that you need in order to make a difference um, in that environment. And I just want to affirm, like I, the, the first lesson I teach my uh, MPP students, again, uh, there are about 10 out of uh, 110 students who are Black, um, and about three quarters of those are Black women. So these are mostly not Black people. <laughs> But one of the first things I teach them is that if you are to understand how race and racism works, both in the US for the past 500 years, but also how it's been exported um, as a colonial power in the world to teach others or to hold others to a certain way of understanding how race works, um, then you have to understand the hypervisibility of blackness. And within that hypervisibility, black women often are figured um, in that way. Uh, so, that's really important for me, both pedagogically, but it's also important to the answer to your question. Because um, when we enter into these places, we often feel like we are compromising our values or principles in the face of the struggles uh, that uh, are oftentimes petty, but very real. And if you can find a way to either institutionalize an understanding of this, this is part of what we can value in terms of equity training, um, or you can socialize a community of people to understand this, then I think you'll have more success in facing whatever challenges come up. Uh, so I just try to be as practical as possible um, in addressing it, because I think these patterns repeat themselves. Um, I have one addendum to Brenda's uh, story about, um, about Blackness. So they wanted to remove Black from the center just about a year and a half before I left the Schomburg Center, my boss at the time um, informed me that Schomburg would no longer get first dibs at books written by uh, Black authors because um, it felt like segregation that a book by a Black person would have to go to the Schomburg when it could just as well go to 42nd and 5th Avenue. Um, and that... Um, they talked to some of the, um, oh gosh, what's the fancy fellowship there? Cullen, is that right? Did I have it right? You apply for a fellowship at, at 42nd Street? Uh, the Schwartzman Building? Yeah. Um, Nobody knows? Jeez. Mm -hmm. Coleman, Coleman Center, correct. So uh, one of the Black um, superstars of the Coleman Center agreed that there was no reason why a book written by a Black person would have to go uh, to the Schomburg, you know, and someone from Schomburg could just call the book from 42nd Street. And so I said to my boss, I said, well, I'll have to talk to the Black women who 
have been working at the Schomburg Center for the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> I was buying time, but the, 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 the takeaway is that we had to resist because essentially what, what they were doing, whether it was intentional or unintentional, were essentially changing the mission of the Schomburg. Yes. Um, and had decided at some arbitrary point in time, you know, this would have been about 2015, that we were past um, the collecting mission most, of this organization, racial, like, that we had reached some kind of nirvana, um, and there was just no reason for this anymore. When, when really what it was about, as what drives a lot of austerity and workplace problems, is that why should we have to buy two books just mm -hmm. because the author happens to be mm -hmm. Black? You can just mm -hmm. buy one, and it'll be at 42nd Street. So. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to like one more, more, one more thing that it, I mean, I think that it, it just reminds me of when Puerto Rican studies was sort of migrating into Latin, Latino, Latina, Latinx like studies, and um, and the question of what happens now, and it was it, it being this sense of invisibility, this sense of Puerto Ricans are not here, not there, and yet they were so much part of the struggle in the 1970s to create the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, to create all the different kinds of, um, of departments here throughout CUNY. And it is, you know, you know, like I, there has to be a way in which we retain the, the history and the uniqueness of specific populations at the same time as we reach out and try to build substantive alliances. Um, and that is always a very tricky thing because there's, you know, because of all the things that that have been mentioned. So I just wanted to put that out there because it's not something unique. So it's something that maybe there's some precedent that can be drawn from, from different historical moments and how people were able to negotiate. But I, I think it, it goes back to, you know, what you, so you mentioned mission, you know, what is your mission? What is your niche holding on to the integrity of that. You know, I think about Toni Morrison, who understands that she's writing to a, a universal audience, but she's writing from the Black gaze, and she's holding on to that. And that's what's that was, makes her writing so powerful. If you understand your mission, your niche, whatever you do is going to be able to affect everyone else. One final question, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking this question. I really want to thank the panel and everybody who has been asking questions and, and affirm um, the concerns that have been posed. Immaculada Lara Bonilla from Ostos Community College. Um, thank you to the panel for this, um, you know, inter, uh, I'm really appreciative of, of this, um, you know, uh, discussion across experiences and across institutions. And one of my questions has to do with this, how do we build coalition, I'm trying to be very brief and very curt. <laughs> um, how do we build coalition across institutions? How do we build coalition across CUNY colleges so that we can support the um, doctoral program and how can we establish, you know, a real hub, a real horizontal hub through the colleges to build a pipeline that will support the programs at the community college level, as well as at the senior college level and into graduate studies. I'm doing the work uh, right now with City College and other colleges across CUNY, got a BRESI grant for um, one of one of my two breast grants for this, another one for the Writers Institute as well, very inspired by this discussion, but specifically uh, coalitional work and not just collaboration, but coalitional work through the colleges and into graduate studies in this year. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's it's a beautiful question with which to end our session. Um, and I am happy for you all to answer, but let me just say one of the things about this being the launch of the Brez Hub is that um, what comes next is in fact um, occasions, affordances, opportunities to work together, um, to think thoughts together, to work really hard on the ideas together, to build curriculum together. Um, and I think that that becomes a ground where we can start to build the kinds of relationships that you're talking about across different institutional formations and to recognize that situationally there might be differences, but that the conversation has to be able to um, reach out across those differences for it to work at CUNY, particularly at CUNY.
So I don't know if is there anything else that you want to add? I, I just want to add, I, I love this, the fact that you're saying bringing that um, from the community through the uh, senior through the graduate level. I think we also in moving forward, if we want to look at what the future is like, we need to have, there are many faculty at the community and other senior colleges who could be teaching at the graduate center. They, there's a wealth that can, can bring. And if we continue to have these kinds of discussions and forums, we need to see more interaction within CUNY and not look at the graduate center as a special elite space because all of us have worked on our degrees. We've done the work and the research and I, that it needs to open up. Um, I just, just, I mean, I, I think that one, one thing that is to think that you have a lot of people rooting for this to work and they may not be in this institution, but they are around. And I think that everybody's just like really um, super excited about, about what is happening here. And um, in any way that, those coalitions can exist beyond here. I, I know that at least from my perspective, it'd be great to um, to be, you know, cheering on or, or present in any way. Um, and also shout out to the community colleges. Like I'm just total fan. I mean, they do, they do, <laughs> they really do the work. And so just, you know. I have one, uh, one just general thing to add. Uh, I think that whenever you're looking for coalition work to happen well, and particularly if the institution itself is resistant to a change, whether it's a funding request or organizational change, um, you have to be really thoughtful about where there are weaknesses institutionally, uh, and then to mobilize people to attack those weaknesses. Um, the most common weakness of all institutions of higher education is reputational, meaning that they are constantly managing their reputation. Um, and so how do you weaken reputation when there's comms departments? I remember once being in a meeting at the, the library and um, this was during the controversy over the, the new building plan that was gonna gut the stacks of the Fifth Avenue um, main library and the Midtown uh, building was gonna be sold. So many of you remember that controversy. And I was being asked along with some of the other research directors, like what's gonna happen? Is research being phased out of the library? Is it just gonna become a really fancy lending library? And so the person in the room who was like the provost of the library at the time said something like, oh, okay, you need an FAQ. Um, an FAQ is a, a, a fact sheet to, to give answers. And, and I'm like, actually, no, I don't need a FAQ. <laughs> we need a conversation about exactly what is happening here. Yes. Like, what is the plan? And then I'll decide how to communicate to people about what that plan is, but I don't need talking points, you know, that is just spin. The point is that the pressure at the time of reputation was seeping into um, the corridors of the library in such a way that, that, that they were feeling the pressure. And I was certainly feeling the pressure. So I just am giving you advice, mobilize resources um, to, to put pressure in places where people will be responsive to change. So. Would you please join me in thanking our panel? Keep an eye out for information on new things happening with the Brez Collaboration Hub next year. Thank you all. Thank you. I do believe that we have many faces that we should have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. It's really wonderful to hear you and know that I love that. No, you have a little too first. I love that. No, you have a little too first. I love that.